All right, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna work on starting to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. I also wanna start this video by discussing this idea of definite versus indefinite integrals. Part one of the fundamental theorem gives us this important link between the idea of our definite integral definition and this idea of antiderivatives. Very specifically, the definite integral is not defined as a function. The definite integral is defined at to be a value evaluated. Specifically, one that we've looked at a bunch here is from zero to two of x squared dx. We've already shown the work that this evaluates to eight thirds. And at this point, you know all of the details of definite integrals of this type. But the move that we're talking about here in step one is we're not gonna think of integration simply as this computing of these areas. We're thinking of this as this, this ability to output a function. And while this will be the basis for all integration moving forward, the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus gives us a way to think about integration as an operation on, a, on functions that output functions. And you've seen this probably previously. In my mind, I don't like showing the indefinite integral before the definite integral, but it's not my choice when textbooks aren't written by me. But importantly is this statement. Instead of always writing it like this, we'll write the idea of this indefinite integral like this. In this statement, the important difference is we have not specified the interval over which we're integrating. In that case, we are defining this statement to be actually of this nature right here, where we're actually looking for it to output the antiderivative. So we know an integral defined in this way is the antiderivative of this f function right here. So in our example, the, the, we call this the indefinite integral of x squared would end up being the antiderivative of x squared, which is x cubed over three plus c. Again, the big takeaway for us from the fundamental theorem of calculus is the fact that integrating, whether you have definite integrals or indefinite integrals, is the same as the concept of using antiderivatives. So it's important as we move forward to remind ourselves of these antiderivatives where really just the opposite of the work we did in differential calculus. So right now what I'm going to do is we work through a table of many of the well-known antiderivatives or indefinite integrals. All right, the first example that we're gonna talk about on this table of indefinite integrals is the case of u to the n. We're integrating with respect to u in this case. This is simply the anti-power rule. What we do is we add one to the exponent and divide by n plus one, and we always get this plus c. It's also important to note for this first example right here, um, n cannot be negative one. It's true for any n value of a constant exponent there, except for negative one. I also want to note that we're always going to add this plus c, and hopefully you remember this from the conversation of antiderivatives. In this case, anything that has this term plus any constant, no matter what the constant is, when we differentiate, we'll end up with this u to the n. Um, this plus c is arbitrary. Um, it is important in many, many cases, though you'll see that when I do an example with a definite integral, we don't have to worry about the plus c because it ends up canceling out. Moving on to the case when n is negative one, in this case, that would be one over u du. By the way, I just want to show you this. We're going to write this more simply. We're going to actually, again, remember this du's be just multiplication. So we're gonna multiply into the new and we usually write this, it just makes it an easier notation to write. So these mean the same thing. And the antiderivative of one over u is the natural log of u. Though again, in this case, as it hopefully was mentioned when you're doing antiderivatives, the absolute value here around the argument of the natural log is important in this case, specifically because there are no domain restrictions outside of zero of this expression right here. Um, natural log naturally only, uh, only takes in positive values. So in order for these domains to match up, you need these absolute values around the natural log. The next example is my favorites because it is somehow both the easiest and the trickiest at the same time in application. If I take e to the u and integrate it, I just get out e to the u plus c. 
Then if we integrate an exponential that is not base e, we get nearly the same thing. Um, we get a to the x, but we have to divide by the natural log of a. And just to remind you of that, that's because when we differentiate this, this expression right here, a to the x, we get out this factor of the natural log of a, and that will cancel it out. Let's now do a few of the basic trig functions. If we integrate, take the indefinite integral of sine of u du, uh, what we get is negative cosine of u plus c. Something that will mess up your brain a little bit this quarter will be the fact that when you take the derivative of sine, you get cosine. When you integrate sine, you get negative cosine. It's these negatives and positives between cosine and sine that will kind of mix up your brain a little bit, but I'm sure you'll get it figured out. In the same way, if I take the integral of the cosine of u, I get sine of u. And then just a couple more, because we'll see them as we come up. Um, we'll look at the one, this has to do with the derivative of tangent. If we take the indefinite integral of secant squared, that is just tangent. And there's no reason to leave out our friends the, the inverse trig functions, so we'll show one of those. If we have the integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared, this is sine inverse of u plus c. These by far are not the only eight indefinite integrals that we will need to use this quarter. And as you'll see, we're going to have tables of a ton of different integral formulas that we're going to use to attack more difficult problems and additional techniques, obviously, to do with our integration. Though I would say at this point in the quarter, these are the eight that you need to get going. These are the ones that should make sense to you, given what you know of differentiation. All right, at the risk of overdoing this one example, I want to show the evaluation of the definite integral from 0 to 2 of x squared using part 2 of the fundamental theorem of calculus. In this case, what this states is that we can evaluate this not with summations and limits and all that jazz or approximations, left endpoint, right endpoint. Instead, we can evaluate this by evaluating the antiderivative of x squared from of b minus the antiderivative with a plugged in. In this case right here, what I'm going to do is write it like this. So the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3, given that anti-power rule, plus c. And we're going to evaluate this from 2 to 0. And we write it in this way right here, from 2 to 0. And this notation right here, all as it means is exactly what we're trying to do here. I'm going to plug in 2 for my x first and I'll get 8 thirds plus c, and then I'm going to subtract plugging in 0 into this, where I'll get 0 thirds plus c. Then to evaluate this, when I do this, I'll get 8 thirds plus c minus 0 and minus c. What will always occur, and this is what I was talking about previously, is that we do get these plus c's when we find this general antiderivative. Though when I'm evaluating a definite integral, what will always happen is those constants in these two terms right here will get canceled out. So in fact, since that always happens, I never have to add this plus c when using a definite integral. I can ignore that constant knowing they would cancel. And in this case, for the last time, we have evaluated this integral and got out 8 thirds. All right, in our second example here, we're being asked to evaluate this definite integral. The first thing I want to make clear is that we, we've got to be careful with our integral properties. We don't have a property that says we can evaluate different factors separately. We have that for terms, but not for factors. So the first thing that I'll have to do in this case is distribute this factor of t to both of these terms. Uh, when I do that here, I'll get the integral from 4 to 8 of 4 times t, now 3 halves plus a 1 here, 1 is 2, two halves, so that end up being 5 halves minus 3t to the plus 1 is now 3 halves there. 
Now I'm going to do the fun of applying the second part of the fundamental theorem. I want to anti-differentiate each of these terms. Now again, when I do this, I can ignore the constants of four. I mean, I need to multiply them afterwards, but they're not actually active in the anti-differentiation. And I'm going to apply the anti-power rule to both of these terms. So what I'll get is four t, add one to this, which will give me seven halves, divided by seven halves, minus three t now to the five halves when I add one there, and I need to divide by the five halves. And we're going to evaluate this from four to eight. Also, I tried to model it there, but just to make it clear so that you can help yourself quickly get this idea of the anti-power rule down, we're gonna need it a lot this quarter. When I anti-differentiate this, I always work on that exponent first, right? I look at it and say, I'm gonna add one to you. Once I write that, I then immediately divide by exactly the same number that I see there. These will always be the same when using the anti-power rule. Um, what I'm going to do now is just clean this up a little bit. I'm dividing by seven halves, which means I'm also, I can think of that as multiplying by two sevenths. So if I rewrite those terms in just a little bit nicer way, I'll have eight sevenths t to the seven halves minus, and this will flip, I'll get six fifths t to the five halves. And we're still evaluating on this interval. Now I've done all the real work. Now I just need to evaluate this, which will still take some calculator work, but I'll write this out. I have eight sevenths. T in this case is eight to the seven halves minus six fifths, eight to the five halves. And then I'm gonna subtract plugging in four, importantly, always put parentheses around this second part, right? Especially when you have multiple terms to make sure you're subtracting each of those terms. It's one of those little algebra things that I'm sure for all of us still gets us caught up. But there we go. So eight, we've got a four plugged into the first term and then subtract six fifths and four to the five halves. That's all really the calculus work. Now the job is to not screw things up and evaluate these plugging in the calculator. And you obviously could each do these, each of these terms separately. I end up plugging it all into my calculator. And what I got out was 1,329.925. In our last example in this video, what we're going to do is employ the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus in a little bit different way than you've seen it represented so far. But I wanna make something very clear about this statement right here. What that is saying is that if we have the integral from let's say from zero to x of sine of t dt, and then we differentiate that with respect to x, what that is saying is that this comes out to be sine of x. So while that's all in good and really important, again, showing the fact that the differentiation and integration are inverse operations, they cancel each other out. What's important in this example that you'll see in some contexts is that we don't go from a constant to x. In this case, we have this expression x cubed up here. The consequence of this is not too complicated, but just remind you of differential properties, which this is all about. In this case, what we're now doing is plugging in x cubed into the cosine function. And so what ends up happening is we need to employ the chain rule here. So to show you what this looks like is the derivative of this will be the cosine of x cubed but then we need to multiply that by the derivative of that inner function x cubed, or in this case, that would be the cosine of x cubed times three x squared. And that's an important example by itself, because we could use that moving forward and you will see examples of that, but it also is showing this fact right here. This always feels weird, like why is there t here and an x here? Well, it doesn't have to be t, but sure as heck, this variable needs to be different than that variable because there's two different things going on. This is the variable that's being integrated and this is this bounding value. That's this definition of this g function right here. But the important part for this example is that if it's an x, 
it all just wipes clean, right? The differentiation and integration end up canceling each other out. If we put something more interesting than, than x there and we're differentiating, we still get this canceling, though the idea of chain rule is still involved.